Hello, my name is Pavel. Uh, today I'm going to talk about solid state drives, the way to the way they seem to handle IO workload in the approach we use in Scylla uh, to get good IO latencies from those drives and hopefully not only from those. So first things first, uh, when talking about managing a server workload, we always mean schedulers, really. Uh, if there are different components that want to get access to some limited resource like CPU time, memory, or as in this talk, disk IOPS or disk bandwidth, then we need a scheduler to manage this access. Uh, for example, in Scylla there is SQL server that may want to read a row from disk. There is a mem table uh, that may want to write itself back to disk. And there is compaction that does want both reading from and writing to this disk all at the same time and in huge portions. So deciding which component should be given which portion of the resource is heavily tied with another important duty of the scheduler. That is preventing the resource from being overloaded. Let's see what it means for disks. If you would try to find out how fast a disk can serve one to four and more requests running simultaneously, you will most likely measure something like this. When the request concurrency and low, and the concurrency here is how many requests are submitted at a time, then disk would complete them at more or less the same time of few microseconds. And this behavior is due to internal parallelism all the modern disks have. As the concurrency grows, the disk, or maybe the kernel driver, will start queuing those requests, thus increasing their latencies. At this part of the measurement, you face the so-called Little's Law. And this part of the plot is stepped on when trying to measure disk's peak throughput. Apparently, the I.O. scheduler should be aware of this behavior. If there is a long queue of requests to be served, it's safe to send uh, several of them into the disk, of course. Uh, on the other hand, sending too many requests will hurt fairness, because disk doesn't know about request priorities, and it will serve them in FIFO order, so more urgent requests will have to wait. Since it's often hard to pin the parallelism value, the good strategy of the scheduler is to specify the desirable I.O. latency goal. Uh, there is a dashed orange line over there on the plot. Uh, and limit the concurrency based on that number. Uh, having said that, the approach to I.O. scheduling can be as simple as configure the maximum concurrency value and don't put more requests into the disk than that. Oh, and don't forget about priorities, of course. Uh, since its early days, Scylla had been using this approach, elaborating the idea of how to get this maximum concurrency value. First, it was literally the number of requests. Uh, later, it was changed to take into account maximum IOPS and maximum bandwidth of the disk. Uh, but since all disks have different IOPS and bandwidths for reads versus writes, this actually was four numbers. And we have a nice blog post about this, by the way. The sheer nothing nature of the SILA score also required this limit to be evaluated in advance with the help of a tool called IOTune. However, this approach didn't show results we wanted. And we wanted to have reads latency to be smaller than uh, one millisecond and to have write latencies, no matter how large really. Uh, for writes, we are more interested in the throughput and larger throughput typically means larger latencies. The biggest mistake in treating the disk like I mentioned uh, is the idea that if the disk has to handle both reads and writes at the same time, we call it mixed workload. Then it won't make any difference between the I.O. direction. 
and the scheduler can assume that available IOPS and bandwidths for reads and writes can be exchanged to one another. Here is the disproving graph. The rightmost bar called peak is the maximum IOPS for reads and writes when they run on their own. The next to a pure bar is the same. Disk is doing just reads or just writes. But, our, the, but the workload has the concurrency of one, that is, doing one request at a time. The measured pure IOPS is lower than the peak one, because disk doesn't exploit its internal parallelism, but it's still expected and stays within the initial model. But next comes the continuous bar. This is the IOPS of mixed workload that consists of both reads and writes with concurrency of one. You see, disk clearly prefers serving writes, even if it means getting the resource from reads. The read IOPS drop more than two times, but writes just few percent. It's quite opposite to what we needed. Next four bars show the same mixed IOPS measurements with the write flow rate limited below its peak values. Read flow remains the same, one by one. Rate limiting writes does make the disk somewhat more fair towards reads, but also somewhat slower. And this observation led us to the idea of what we later called rate limited scheduling. To get better understanding of how disks handle mixed I.O., we tried to generate a complete rate profile of a disk. That is, measure what latencies would we observe if loading the disk with mixed workload uh, with different reads and writes intensities. There is a whole lot of measurements indeed, uh, let alone the fact that there are four independent parameters to change, two IOPS values and two request sizes. So the results had to be also somehow represented. All those tasks were solved with the help of a tool called Disklorer, and here is how that profile looks for one of the popular cloud instances. Uh, we didn't actually try to draw four-dimensional space in Google presentations. Sorry about that. Uh, here is the two-dimensional slice of it. X-axis is the right bandwidth y-axis is the read bandwidth. Well, it's read IOPS actually, but uh, since requests are of a fixed size in this area, it can be called bandwidth. Colored squares represent the observed latencies of reads, and the tool draws a scale to the right with, uh, with, the, with the exact value. What's important here is the more bluish the color is, the smaller the latency is. Here, the scheduler should stay if it wants to provide good latency. This picture shows that the safety area is tricky, but since we are not pursuing the minimal latency, but rather won't have some fixed one, it's enough to stay below the diagonal line in this uh, read-write area. Oh, and while we are here, that's not how all disks look like, apparently. Uh, different disk models on different cloud instances types behave differently, but pretty much all the disks we've checked show the profile that can be described uh, by the mentioned diagonal line. So let's move on and look closer at the line. On the language of equations, we can get back to the four-dimensional space uh, and describe the safety area like this. The scheduler should take the real bandwidths and real IOPS it sends to the disk, normalize them by their maximum values, sum up the resulting components, and make sure it doesn't exceed some constant. Likely 1.0, but not necessarily. The idea actually remains the same. Scheduler should limit itself in the amount of requests it puts into the disk but the cutoff decision becomes a little bit more complicated. This math looks pretty simple, but note that both bandwidths and IOPS are something per second values that are hard to measure instantly. Requests arrive into the queue at irregular intervals, so uh, 
to get the idea of their rate, only some middle or long term estimation is possible. And of course, this estimation would reflect some history of the measurements. And this history may easily get out of that safety area for some time. It takes more efforts to put this equation into code. Fortunately, to somehow control the units per second growth, there is a nice algorithm called token bucket. Briefly, the algorithm can turn a chaotic input flow of requests into some output flow with its rate staying below the configured threshold. The illustration, and actually the implementation too, of this algo is usually a bucket that's filled with tokens at the desired fixed rate. And when a request wants to be served, it should carry away some tokens from that bucket. If no tokens available, the request should wait or should be dropped. And also the bucket is limited with the maximum amount of tokens it can hold. From the mathematician point of view, what this algorithm does, it accumulates the total number of requests and makes sure the speed of the growth of this accumulator doesn't exceed the configured limit. And that's almost exactly what we need. With some effort, it's possible to demonstrate that the original scheduling equation can be converted into something that A matches the token bucket equation and B contains some easy to calculate value, just the total number of request costs, where the cost of a request is 1 divided by some number plus the request length divided by some other number. This cost can be calculated for every request. The accumulated cost, which is the sum of costs of all requests seen so far, can also be calculated instantly without the need to apply sliding, averaging, approximation or any other long-term estimation math. In the end of the day, the latency-friendly scheduling strategy looks like this. Get a token bucket, fill it with tokens at 1 Hz rate. Measure each incoming request cost to be 1 divided by, by maximum IOPS value plus its size divided by the maximum bandwidth value. Tokens are floating points number here, but that's not a big problem. Voila! Here's what we called rate-limited scheduler. Some funny part about this approach uh, is that the dimension of a request cost here is neither bytes nor item nor bytes per second nor anything like this, but just duration, that is seconds or milliseconds or even microseconds. And it's a bit counterintuitive actually to read logs or analyze metrics where requests are measured in seconds, but still. So, boring theory is over, how about practice? As for today, the described algorithm is implemented in the operating system called CSTAR, on top of which Scilla is built. Scilla itself is going to have that CSTAR version in the next release. Uh, in order to make it work, it's only necessary to provide the IO properties YAML file even generated by the IOTune tool from the older Scylla version. However, since some disks profile isn't linear, like I mentioned above, uh, above for those disks, a manual update of the IO properties file might be needed, but we are going to automate this as well. Other than the scheduler itself, uh, we are also going to export those weird accumulated costs in seconds via Prometheus metrics. The reason it's not yet there is actually one of the hardest things programmers have to deal with. We are selecting good name for these metrics. Uh, what else? One of the most notable longer term plans is to make the scheduler tune itself uh, on the fly by changing the constant I mentioned in the math above above not to be 1.0 but to uh, dynamically change with the load. Uh, 
The testing is still going, uh, but we already have some early results. Uh, for example, here are the query class latencies during the Cassandra stress testing. The loader's profile uh, was configured to generate both select queries and update queries, and the update flow was intensive enough to make memtable flushing and compaction up and running most of the time, because we wanted to uh, have mixed workload on the disk. Pure workload works like charm, e even without those changes. So the leftmost measurement is the SIL version with its older I.O. scheduler on board. Next comes the measurement with the new scheduler. As you can see, it has uh, notably lower latencies. And the last one is how the new scheduler behaves when being legacy configured with the I.O. properties YAML file taken from the older I.O. tune run. The results look promising. Uh, and we hope they will stay the same. At least we have some clear evidence that the new scheduler is smart enough not to lock up the queue completely. So this is it. Thank you for watching. Uh, please stay in touch. If you are interested, you can try to reach me uh, most preferably by the email. I have a Twitter, but I'm not actively using it. And I didn't manage to remove the Twitter bird from this slide, so here it is. Thanks again, and have fun.